In this last video on potential fluid flow, I want to talk about how we can incorporate conformal mapping into our discussion. So as we've seen throughout chapter two, this is really the primary focus of chapter two, is we can use conformal mapping to map complicated geometries in the z-plane into simpler geometries in the w-plane, solve the problem there, and map the solution back. So let's illustrate how we can do that in the context of potential flow and learn a few new tidbits along the way that'll be helpful to us. So here I've just compiled the uh, nomenclature and the equations that we've been using, nothing new here. We have the physical plane, that's the z-plane, transform plane, that's the w-plane. We have the forward map, little f of z, we have the inverse map, big F of w, and then capital phi is little phi plus i psi. In the context of potential flow, phi is the velocity potential, and psi is the stream function, and then of course there's the map version of that in the w-plane. Everything just has hats on it for the dependent variables. Then we have our Laplace's equations for the velocity potential and the stream function in both the z and the w-plane. So again, nothing new there just to remind us of all the terminology. Let's illustrate this through an example. So I'm going to solve a problem that we actually did in a previous video, and that's flow past a circular cylinder. So when we solved this before, we solved it using superposition of our basic flows. We had a uniform flow plus a doublet that gave us this flow around a circular cylinder. Now I'm going to do it using conformal mapping. We'll get the same solution in the end, but I want to show how to do it using conformal mapping. So here's the mapping. W is f of z. It's z plus r0 squared over z. r0 here is the radius of our circular cylinder. All right, so here's our flow in the z-plane. We have a circular cylinder, and we want to get the flow around it. So we need to map this. This is our problem, can't solve it. So we need to map this into a simpler problem. Well, we can do that using this transformation, z plus r0 squared over z. And if you look at what the image of this circle is, it turns out that it's this elongated shape here. It has actually infinitesimal thickness. I've drawn it with some thickness so you can see it but it's actually infinitesimally thin. And essentially we've just squashed down our circular shape into a finite plat plate that's aligned with the flow. Well, that couldn't be much easier, right? Because what's the solution of a uniform flow past a flat plate that's aligned with the flow? Well, the flow doesn't even actually see the presence of the flat plate at all because it's infinitesimally thin. It's aligned with the flow flow just slips right over our flat plate. So the solution couldn't be any simpler. And this is now in the W plane, so it's capital phi hat of W, is the uniform flow U times W. So the uniform flow speed U times W. Well, all right, so that's the solution. It was as simple as that. Now, what is the solution back in the Z plane? So this is the solution in the W plane. We substitute in for W from the mapping which is this right here, and we get that capital Phi of Z, the complex potential function in the Z plane, is simply U times Z plus U times R sub zero squared over Z. Well, again, that looks familiar. That's precisely the solution that we got from superposition for the flow around a circular cylinder. So I'm not gonna go through all the details of getting the Phi's and the Psi's and the VR's and V theta's because we actually already did that. So here, the S, the strength of the doublet, is now U times R0 squared. All right, so that's just illustrating how we can use conformal mapping to, again, simplify the geometry, make it easier to solve Laplace's equation in the W-plane, map it back to the Z-plane. So let's take a look at another interesting fact about these mappings. And it, it's, it's actually quite surprising because you think of the mapping as being just a tool to go from the Z to the W-plane to make our problem easier. But it turns out it actually relates directly to some of the features in the flow, namely the stagnation points in the flow. So let's, let's see how that is the case. So here is the complex conjugate of the complex velocity in the z-plane. And so that's just d cap phi dz. We can do the same in the w-plane. So that's just d cap phi hat dw. Well, from the chain rule, because phi is equal to capital phi hat. Again, the values are the same at the image points in the two planes, it's just that the points have moved around. The chain rule tells us that d cap phi dz is just d cap phi hat dw times dw dz. But dw dz, what is that? That's f prime of z. 
W is the mapping itself. And so DW, DZ is the derivative of that mapping. All right, so then we can relate the complex conjugate of the complex velocities in the Z and the W plane. They're related by this factor, F prime of Z, F prime of Z. So whereas the capital phi values are the same, the W values aren't, the velocities aren't, they differ by the value of F prime of Z at each point and so on. So, so that's true and, and, and that's helpful, but take a look at what happens when F prime of Z is equal to zero. What is that? Well, that's the critical point of the mapping. Okay, so what that's saying is, if I have a critical point of the mapping, which is F prime of Z is zero, then the values of the velocities, no matter what they are in the W plane, they're going to be zero at the corresponding image points in the Z plane. So that leads to a very interesting conclusion. The critical points of our mapping, which seem to have nothing to do with the physical problem at all, actually correspond to stagnation points in the physical domain. So this is where it's really important. Uh, we think of our intuition as being developed by our physical understanding, our experience with how systems actually behave and so on. But we need to also augment our intuition and inform our intuition by the mathematics. The mathematics helps us better understand the physics of our systems that we're interested in and contributes to that intuition in a very, very helpful way. So there's this beautiful marriage, beautiful interplay between the math and the physics that I keep emphasizing. And here's another very interesting example of that. Now for you fluid dynamics geeks, you'll remember that streamlines can only branch at stagnation points. So you can only have a streamline, a single streamline that branches off into two separate streamlines that can only occur at a stagnation point. Well, let's take this fact that we just learned, critical relationship between critical points and stagnation points. Let's apply that to the, the uh, circular cylinder. So I could look at the velocity components, right? We could determine where is the velocity zero, vr, v theta zero, and determine the stagnation points in that way. And or I could get them from the critical points of the mapping. Let's do the latter, because that's really straightforward. So f of z, remember, is just z plus r zero squared over z. So the derivative of that is one minus r zero squared over z squared. And let's write that in uh, as a fraction here, z squared minus r zero squared over z squared. Factor the numerator into z plus r zero times z minus r zero. And then set that equal to zero. So what are the values of z that satisfy the equation f prime of z is equal to zero? Well, it's when z is minus r zero and plus r zero. So we find that the critical points of the mapping are where z is plus or minus r zero. So where are those? Well, those are at the leading edge and trailing edge, or the front of the circular cylinder and the back of the circular cylinder, right along the symmetry line on the real axis. So again, it's interesting that we can determine something physical about the flow, namely where the stagnation points are, where the velocities are zero, simply by looking at the mapping itself. Uh, it's very interesting. So again, I'll just remind you that there is indeed a singularity at the origin. We've discussed this before. So I want to finish the video by just mentioning two very useful transformations. First is the schwarz christoffel transformation. Second is the Joukowsky transformation. You can find a lot more about these in any book on potential flow, such as Panton, for example. I'm just going to do one slide on each just and just give you an idea of how they can be used. So schwarz christoffel we can map the interior of any polygon with, say, n vertices into the upper half of the W plane. Now you can see I've got the Z and the W plane switched here. So we're mapping the polygon over here, which is just some shape made up of a bunch of straight lines. And we can map that into the upper half plane of the W plane. And then we know the solution. And the mapping is actually here. It's given in terms of an integral. And each of these points, these are vertices for our polygon. And then the k's, which you see the powers of each of these factors, those are related to the angles in the polygon. In any case, so you can take the interior of any polygon and map it to the upper half plane. You can even put vertices of the polygon at infinity. So in that way, you can actually have inlets and outlets to your polygonal shapes, and therefore map that to the upper half plane, solve it, map the solution back. Very flexible, very powerful transformation. The other one I just want to mention is the Joukowsky transformation. 
This is really just a generalization of the mapping that we used at the beginning of this video to solve the flow around a circular cylinder. So here it is in general form. This is the inverse mapping. Z is capital F of W is W plus C squared over W squared. And then here's the, the forward map. Just flip that around. W is a function of Z. And by choosing different values of C, which is just a complex constant, you can get different types of mappings, different types of shapes. So let's think of it in terms of the target being in the W plane, the circular cylinder. And then the Z plane is different things I can map into the circular cylinder. So we've already seen that I can do the flat plate into a circular cylinder. We actually did the opposite circular cylinder into a flat plate. You can do an ellipse into the circular cylinder. And you can also do what's something called the Joukowsky airfoil into the circular cylinder. And again, all it is is choosing different values of C to get these different shapes. Obviously, we know now the solution for the flow around a circular cylinder. So if I can map any one of these into that, then that's great. Now, the Joukowsky airfoil, just to warn you, is not an airfoil that you'll see on any airplane anywhere. It's, it's kind of a chubby airfoil. But the nice thing is it's really helpful to use to look at, for example, the effective angle of attack on lift and drag of an airfoil and things like that. So it is useful, but it is not an airfoil that you'll actually see built and used for an aircraft.